Good evening. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Welcome. I'm Jeffrey Burns from the Harps Center for Catholic Thought and Culture. It's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight and to introduce or to welcome our president, James Harris. Thank you, Jeffrey. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of San Diego. And as the saying goes, timing is everything. So here we are at a prominent Catholic university at the nation's first school of peace, and joined by luminaries on the subject of national defense, nonviolence, and justice in our contemporary world. And to top it off, this important dialogue is taking place. I didn't know this. One of my colleagues shared this with me this week on the Roman Catholic feast day of Our Lady of the Rosary and the anniversary of what has been described as a miraculous victory by the combined fleet of the Holy League in 1571 over the Ottoman Navy at the Battle of Lepanto, one of the largest naval battles in Western history, a battle that had significant impact on the history of Europe and on the Ottoman Empire. So the dialogue on the principles of just war, just peace, and nonviolence is certainly a timely and enduring topic that resonates with current national and global challenges facing our world. I want to thank our event sponsors, the Harp Center and Dr. Burns, for his incredible work in putting this together, and also the Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice here on our campus for this important dialogue. I would like to thank the Most Reverend Bishop Robert McElroy of the Diocese of San Diego for being with us this evening, and I'll be introducing him in just a moment, as well as our special guest speaker, His Eminence Cardinal Peter Turkson, close advisor to our beloved Pope Francis, who has helped us to coalesce the principles of Christian nonviolence and just peace. So I have a personal story I'd like to share. In the summer of 2016, uh, we had written to Cardinal Turkson and talked about him coming to campus on this date, and uh, I went to his office. I was at the Vatican, and I went to his office, and I walked in expecting to have five minutes maybe to talk to his secretary. Instead, the Cardinal came out, met me. We went into a uh, into a, his office and we spent uh, about an hour visiting and sharing stories and I learned uh, much more about him. And then at the end, I was getting ready to leave and he said, oh, do you need a ride? And I was getting ready to go over to the U.S. Embassy for a meeting we had over there. And uh, I said, yes, sir, I, I, I'll go downstairs. And I know where the cab stand. He goes, oh, well, I'll go with you. So down the steps, out the front door, across the plaza, we went out. And I don't know how many of you had this experience, but I had the Cardinal hail me a cab. <laughs> the cab driver got out and knew him and was a little shocked that he had hailed him, but he, uh, he sent me off on my way. So uh, talk about, we, we discuss servant leadership here and the idea in, the, in our Catholic faith of audacious hospitality, and he certainly represents both. And we also have that type of servant leadership in our bishop, Bishop Robert McElroy. Now, I have to say that Bishop McElroy has never hailed me a cab, so that's one thing. <laughs> but I want you to know how blessed we are at the university that we have a spiritual shepherd who makes it a point to regularly attend campus events. He's engaged with our campus community on many important and timely topics of interest, from ways to deepen interreligious dialogue and community alliances to the value of programs and ministries that advance immigrant integration. He has shared with students his perspective on civic virtue, the dignity of the human person, and advancing the common good. Bishop McElroy encourages all to promote understanding, to see things through the lens of others, to raise honest questions, and to search out truth in all areas and from all sources. Most importantly, he brings our campus together many times each year through the celebration of math, Mass during academic year. So it's my privilege and honor to welcome the true channel of peace, uh, for our university and the San Diego community, Bishop Robert McElroy. <clears throat> just a minute. <laughs> now, I just want to let you know, Jim, I've got arranged with Uber to take you over to your house. <laughs> It is a great honor to be here tonight and to welcome Cardinal Turkson uh, into our diocese uh, to speak to us tonight, and particularly within this context of Catholic peace building, which is a revolutionary, in the best sense of that word, 
uh, movement in the life of the church to understand how the call of Christ to nonviolence could really take root in our society and in our world. Uh, Cardinal Turkson is a wonderful emissary for the call to nonviolence. He is from Ghana, where he grew up. Happily for us, he was educated in part at the seminary in New York after seminary in Ghana, and uh, then ordained a priest. And there are three reasons tonight that I think he particularly is a great prophet for what we are wrestling with uh, in the, in the uh, seminars today and tonight. First of all, he is a student of scripture. That was his field of study after he was ordained. He studied scripture on the doctoral level in Rome, in the Old Testament. And thus he understands that as people of faith, we stand in the light of the claim of scripture upon us that forms who we are. It forms how we are called to transform this world. And thus he understands in a very powerful way that the call of Jesus in the scriptures to nonviolence falls upon us as a moral claim that we must wrestle with seriously, cannot dismiss as merely something visionary, but must come to grips with and ask ourselves, how do we make this real in the world in which we live? Secondly, when Cardinal Turkson became Archbishop of Cape Coast in Ghana, he became a pastor. And as a pastor, he was a distinguished bridge builder within his own diocese, in the leadership of the church in Ghana, and in the leadership of the church in Africa as a whole, in which he had many prominent positions of leadership. As a bridge builder, he understood that he had to reach out to the very diverse communities of Africa, Muslim, Catholic, Protestant, of all the different economic and socio-stratus, and to find ways of building community, which he did as a pastor, and he did as a leader within the nation and within the continent. And finally today, we are honored to have him here because he was the head of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace from 2009 to 2017, and now is head of the Dicastery on Integral Human Development, which was in a way an expansive successor to the Pontifical Council. And he is called to bring the church's social teaching into the world of this moment, the long tradition of Catholic faith and Catholic social teaching, and to assist the Pope throughout the whole of the world and the local churches to understand what does Catholic teaching mean in the concrete now. And thus, he is a great prophet of what that means in the current day. He really brings new wine in new wineskins and helps both producing the new wine and creating the new wineskins. You know, we all know that Pope Francis had brought so many new major initiatives in social teaching, you know, Laudato Si and the, the care of stewardship in the poor and how we reach out to them, how we see them as brothers and sisters and collaborators in building up the world in which we live, how we make peace more a reality in a world all too filled with violence. And in his work as head of the dicastery now, one of the things that has distinguished everything he has undertaken has been the way he has taken these new initiatives and found ways of artfully making them accessible to people, making them realistic, making them visionary, and making them obviously pathways of faith in which God's presence is truly there. For these three reasons, it is a wonderful grace for our diocese and for this university to have Cardinal Turkson here. And we welcome you tonight and look forward to your words.
Well, thank you, Bishop. <laughs> it gives me a sense uh, of what can be written on my epitaph when I die. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, uh, President uh, uh, Harris, President of this university, uh, my Lord Bishop, Deacon, and all of you distinguished professors, guests of this assembly, and uh, our friends from the military who have been with us all day today. I wish to thank uh, you, pres Mr. President of the uh, of. Uh, of San Diego, University of San Diego, for this kind invitation that has made me part of this workshop and this discussion this uh, all day today. Began last night, and uh, I, 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 I kind of feel <clears throat> if I'd been here last night, then I'll probably have spoken last night, and all of this would be over. Then you'd probably have a nice Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening, and you'll be doing whatever you'll be doing. But Thank you for coming this evening uh, to share a little bit of uh, what we've been discussing this past two days. Invited to address the theme for our gathering this past two days on just war, just peace, the two of them in conversation, I'd like to just take this a little bit home to our office and to what we do. So to consider all of this eventually from the point of view of the latest encyclical of Pope Francis, Laudato Si, Care for Creation, Social Encyclical on Ecology. So my dear friends said a talk about violence, nonviolence, and peace belongs to one of the issues our, our dicastery office has to deal with. So an invitation to attend any such meeting was just something I couldn't say no to, and so knew that I had to be here. Only thing I probably need to apologize for was that I couldn't arrive early yesterday to have been part of the opening, uh, opening ceremonies. So my dear friends, we live in a moment in human history when the fear about potential global catastrophe has intensified to a point rarely experienced before in the past. Our conversation is this decisive for what it can bring and needs to bring to this experience. The decisions made by the global human family about peace and war in the coming months and years, particularly those with potential political responsibility, will have very profound consequences for the future of humanity and, indeed, for the future of our planet. Invited then to contribute to discussion and reflection on the issue of Christian nonviolence and, and peace and war, I just wish to do something very basic and something very simple. I'd like to contribute to this whole conversation addressing four issues. First, I shall mention the shortcoming, if not failure, of war and violence to conclusively resolve any conflict in the world. And in so doing, I shall be sharing with you some of the, some of the considerations and thoughts that led our dicastery office in Rome to partner with Pax Christi to hold the first conference in Rome about Christian nonviolence. Then after that, I shall recall how Jesus sets before us a nonviolent way of life as, a, excuse me, as an effective way to promote peace and the common good. 
In this, I shall be suggesting that the discovery in the life and the ministry of Jesus of nonviolence indicates, points out to us a very solid way to travel in our search for peace in our world and solutions for against all the instances of violence. But I shall be suggesting that this ultimately calls for a conversion of each one of us deep from the heart. Thirdly, I shall briefly explain the church's development of Jesus' nonviolent proposal through an attempt in the past in the history of the church to theologize, to formulate a theological principle around us which engendered the famous just war theory and how in the course and the passage of time, this theory has been very, very variously adapted with regard to its content and its sense. Then finally, referring to Pope Francis again, and in line with the church's social teaching, I shall then try to argue that integral human development or integral ecology, as Pope Francis develops it, which calls us and invites us all to recognize how interrelated everything in the world is, probably signals a pathway for the development of any solid Christian sense of nonviolence. So this, my dear friends, is what I'd like to do with you, uh, you, know, uh, with you this evening. And uh, all of you probably haven't had supper before coming. I hope this doesn't create any indigestion for any of you. <laughs> and uh, I hope it just promotes our understanding of everything that we've been doing the past two days. So first, the failure of, uh, of war to solve conflicts in our world. And by way of doing this, I'd like to refer you all. We are in a Catholic university. So to refer to you to an episode in the scriptures, which is very fundamental for everything that we shall be discussing tonight. And wherever else you decide to discuss the issue of nonviolence and peace and war and all of those. My dear friends, you recall that in the Gospel of Luke, the second chapter, when Jesus was born, there's a story about angels who brought a message to some shepherds who were keeping their flock in the night. And the message of the angels was very striking. Glory be to God on high and on earth, peace to men of goodwill or men whom God loves. And I refer to this at the beginning of, of my you know, reflection with you or my conversation with you this evening because at the time of the birth of Jesus, the Romans, through their military conquest, had established what they call Pax Augustana, the peace of Augustus. So all of the Middle East lived under the peace of Augustus, Pax Augustana. So Pax Augustana reigned over all of the Middle East. So precisely in this, Jesus is born, and when he's born, the angels say, peace on earth to men of goodwill. So we have two proposals of peace. Peace of Augustus and peace related with the birth of Jesus. And this basically sets the tone for everything else that we shall be discussing in scriptures. There are two types of peace. There's peace established by Augustus, and we know how he did it, with a military force of Rome, the Roman army, which a true conquest imposed a certain amount of peace. Yet when Jesus is born in this peace, he declares another peace. Peace on earth to those of goodwill or those whom God loves. And this means that we invited to recognize these two levels of peace in human history. We can seek and try to fashion peace according to Augustus, 
but we invited also to establish and live peace the way of Jesus. And this is peace established with the help of God, those whom God loves. So we invited, as it were, to either live with the peace of Augustus or through the grace and the help of God, live another peace. And so later on in the gospel, Jesus himself will say, I give you peace, not as the world gives peace. So we need to recognize that from the from way from the outset, from the outset that we are dealing with two types of peace. Two types of peace are offered to us. That of Augustus and that of Jesus. And therefore the discussion that takes place in all contexts and all situations of the talk about peace and establishment of peace and violence and all of that needs to recognize the two. But when we adopt, we decide to look at the peace established or the peace pronounced by Jesus, we need to recognize that that's a peace that's offered to us with the help of grace, with the help of the grace of God. And this basically invites us to consider the basic underlying anthropology, Christian anthropology, with which we enter all of this discussion. Human nature invited to pursue all the virtues in the world still pursues them as a fallen nature. That's what we are from the book of Genesis. We share a fallen nature, which is, however, invited to grace in Christ. So we share a fallen nature, but we're not left there. We're not abandoned in this fallen nature. We're invited to rise in the grace of God to something else. And this just means that all our discussion and conversation on this issue needs to recognize these basic parameters of human life, which then also provide the parameters of our discussion. Sometimes the discussion is limited to the thing about the fallen nature, as if nothing else has happened to the human race. But the human race is not just the fallen nature. It's a fallen nature invited to rise in Christ with his grace to another level of existence. And it's, it's, it's the tension between these two that we, Christians, live in. Born on one level, we're invited by the grace of God to live on another level. So our conversation tonight about invitation to Christian nonviolence and grace and uh, peace uh, and conflict and war is going to be basically guided by this reflection, which, which you know, I, uh, I, I, I commend to you for your further detailed you know, deepening to explore all its sense. So starting with a question, uh, with a question then, we probably would want to ask, on the basis of just what I've said, that does any of you then believe that violence can achieve any goal of lasting value in this world? To answer this question here, presided in San Diego and so in North American context, it is worth remembering what Dr. Martin Luther King said at one point the night before he was killed. He had said that the choice we face is no longer violence or non-violence. The choice we face is it's, a, a, it, a, a, it's non-violence or non-existence. Today, sadly, we are still at this crossroad. When tempted to respond with violence, when we tempted to respond with to violence with violence. And so, attempted to do so, we shall never achieve what peacemakers actually look for. And so, to say that we must always choose nonviolent response to conflict is easy to say, but difficult to put into action. The temptation to use violence is strong in a world of fear where people are desperate for safety and for security. That is the nature of our world now. And so, for example, the terrorist attacks that have afflicted our world in the past few years 
have dramatically increased people's fear and sense of insecurity. And when fear gets into the driver's seat, we cannot promote peace because we're all more inclined to respond to violence with violence. However, if we want peace, as Pope Francis clearly puts it, we must then counter the logic of fear with the ethic of responsibility. And so foster a climate of trust and sincere dialogue, meaning a nonviolent response to our fears and our quest for security. A similar temptation to respond, a similar temptation to respond violently to violence is found when nations feel threatened by other nations and hence want to respond to such a threat with counter threats. The very famous principle of deterrence basically works with this. You counter threat with threat, and that hopefully will keep everybody quiet. Consequently, however, there arises the need to disproportionately increase military budget, to develop and stockpile new weapons in the name of national security or peace. Some nations even invest large portions of their financial resources in the ongoing development of nuclear weapons, despite the immense risk that this poses to the world. In a documentary on how Pakistan developed its nuclear power, as you know, Pakistan and India were racing who developed nuclear power first, and, and the UN, as usual, came with sanctions. This is 1988, 1989. So when you look at the talk, you listen to a talk about sanctions for North Korea, you can think about this other case. UN imposed a lot of sanctions on Pakistan and India, and as a result, none of them developed atomic weapons, right? No. Despite all the sanctions, so both of them are now <coughs> nuclear power states. Now, when India you know, uh, tested this weapon, Pakistan, the uh, Pakistan, you know, uh, head of the security was interviewed, and he said, if Pakistanis have to live on grass so that they develop an atomic weapon, so be it. We'll be ready to do that. So they're ready to live on grass so they can come up with the resources to develop an atomic weapon. So nations do so despite the need to invest in more urgent needs for human well-being, such as health, the creation of good jobs, or care for the environment. At least twice already, as we know, the U.S. Bishops' Conference wrote about this and drew our attention to great need for this in 83 and 1993. The bishops of the United States have observed that nuclear armament is never an appropriate policy that constructs a long-term basis for peace. The threat of war cannot be reduced with the possession of armaments. Threats and fears are dealt with rather with deep and honest dialogue and reconciliation processes at all levels. At the beginning of this, we kind of figured this should take about an hour. So, so I, I like to limit my digressions and all of that. Otherwise, what the Pope suggests over here is the type of things that pull the world through the great Cuban Missile Crisis. It was dialogue. It was relationships. John the 23rd had been elected Pope in Rome. The Communist Party of Rome decided to celebrate its Congress. And for the first time, a Pope sent a message, a congratulatory message to the Communist Party. That message gets conveyed to Russia, Khrushchev. So if Khrushchev knows that now in the Vatican there's somebody 
who began to talk to the Communist Party. And shortly thereafter, a nephew of his visits the Vatican. And so when in the depth of the Cuban Messiah crisis, Pope John Paul, John XXIII, wrote his letter asking whatever, it didn't take long. Khrushchev was already friendly with Pope John XXIII. They were already partners talking and in conversation. And John Kennedy here, at least was a Catholic. So the Cuban human crisis, we were safe from that, you know, missile, uh, you know, great nuclear threat, not by anything, but by the development of relationships and the power of those relationships discovered and then put into practice. A third example that we can look at of the temptation to respond violently to a situation of conflict is when people are filled with an in, uh, inordinate desire to possess and to have more, usually sustained by the myth of perennial material growth. The wasteful and the irresponsible use of the resources of the earth wreaks havoc first to the earth and then to the poor of the earth, who may then react with violence and conflict over scarce resources. And so communities and states may fight one another in a violent competition for natural resources. So the causes of our experience of violence and the various levels of our existence are several. Violence may be brought to us and we may suffer it as passive victims of violence. But we can also respond to violence brought to us in kind, namely with violence. As in the case of an aggressor in war, or even ordinary in our schools, when a student is bullied, sometimes he gets home and gets something with which he can fight back. So violence is countered with violence. In both cases, however, one can still remember the words of Dr. Martin Luther King and his advice that such a situation will take us nowhere. It will take us to our own destruction and to our own non-existence. And so, in his own way, Pope John, John Paul II considers violence as evil and says that violence is unacceptable as a solution to problems. For violence actually destroys what it claims to defend. That is the dignity, the life, the freedom of people and nations. And so the question is, how can we respond actively and peacefully then to violence surrounding us without falling into the temptation of being violent ourselves? Or, as the servant of God, Dorothy Day, question, how do we make the world more safe through nonviolence? And this takes me to the second point about what Christ teaches us. The approach of Christian nonviolence as suggested by Christ. And so to stop the spiral of violence, we cannot afford to be naive. We must first and foremost acknowledge its presence and face it. And this is what Pope Francis teaches us. In order to do so peacefully yet effectively, we can learn from Jesus. So the Jesus style is what we want to look at now. The life of Jesus can be our inspiration and our guide in this regard. The way Jesus teaches us to face violence and conflicts is through an active nonviolent attitude. And we've discussed this abundantly today. He himself lived in, a, in, a, in a violent times but did not resort to violence. While announcing the kingdom of God, he highlighted the power of care and mercy over domination and violence. He blessed the peacemakers. He called on us to love everyone, even our enemies. And he gave a command that, 
He gave a, he gave a command to uh, love our enemies as we love ourselves. A command that Pope Benedict XVI would refer to as the mania character of Christian nonviolence. Jesus also rejected the use of violence, even during his passion, and his cross became a symbol of reconciliation. Jesus' resurrection then was not a symbol of revenge or vendetta, but rather a new life that brought the gift of new peace to his community and the whole of the universe. The resurrection was, in, in fact, the ultimate symbol of the victory of love over evil, of active nonviolence over violence, of the way of peace over the way of war. His disciples were therefore called to share this special and new peace of nonviolence with everyone as they were sent to preach the gospel. And so the church's proposal to limit conflict and violence, which later on got formulated as a just war theory, was an attempt to make this apply. Despite Jesus' teaching on an active nonviolent approach to conflict, the world is still violent, is still a very violent place. And so due to the horrors of war from the time of St. Augustine of Hippo, who lived between 354 and 430, the church sought to develop a moral tradition aimed at limiting the devastation of war. And this became what later on is referred to as the just war theory. But when it was formulated, its objective was to limit the devastation of war, if not war itself. So as societies and the world develop, this theory is also gradually being adapted to suit the different sectors which make use of it. And so in reality, there is no such term as good war. No war can ever be good. War can never be morally good. And so the just war theory has always had this as its starting point. While it attempts to lay out conditions under which the use of force may be morally legitimate, such as in response to acts of aggression, for the protection of civilians, and for the goal of peace. For force to be morally legitimate, it must be the last resort, authorized by a legitimate authority and for a just cause, such as a response to aggression, invasion, genocide, or anything of the kind. But revenge or punishment are never just causes. And so they may never and can never be evoked as a cause for war. It is vital then to recall that the intention of the just war theory has always been to reduce war and hopefully also to abolish it and not to justify it. Indeed, for the church, all citizens and all governments are obliged to work for, work for the avoidance of war. We read this in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 2308. All citizens and all governments are obliged to work for the avoidance of war. And so given the evils and the injustices that accompany all wars, especially in the era of modern weapons and their potential cause and their great potential to cause irreparable damages to societies and to environment, the church has raised the ethical standards with which one could try to justify war. And so Pope Pius XII reduced this theory to legitimate defense. John the 20, Pope John XXIII stressed the absurdity of war, hence the difficulty to declare it as just. Pope Paul VI identified war with a scandal. And identifying war with a scandal therefore meant that it was sinful. And St. John Paul II 
reduce this theory to its very barest minimum so that in the catechism of the church, in the section that deals with the commandment thou shalt not kill, the church writes that our Lord asks for peace of heart and denounce murderous anger and hatred of all kind, so that there be no more war. So, my dear friends, in short today, the just war theory demands that all conflicts must be judged by at least three standards. Legitimacy in entering into conflict, fighting by just means, and justice after the conflict ends. If you're interested in the Latin expression, jus ad bellum, the legitimacy of entering into conflict, jus in bello, so fighting by just means, and jus post bellum, Justice after a conflict, so the possibility of repairing everything and restoring good order and peace. I know I'm in the United States. I know I'm studying in San Diego. I know there's a big military apparatus here, harbor and everything. But I cannot also feel something just comes to my mind. Without, you know, I don't want to get into any problems. <laughs> uh, now, just that I know I tweeted, I tweeted about this. Because, uh, because uh, a colleague working in my office came one afternoon feverishly calling me to a TV uh, program, and that was the commissioning of the new battleship Gerard Ford. Are you uh, you're not aware of that? No? The U.S. did lately commission a battleship called Gerard Ford. No? Yeah, <laughs> no, it was meant to defend you. Because, because, because the president at the commission said that this is steel cut by American hands and steel made from American steel. And we're hoping that this would make anybody who thinks about bringing war to the United States think twice so that nobody brings war to the United States. Then he goes on, uh, we hope nobody brings war to the United States. But if battle, if war does come to the United States, we don't seek to fare. We don't seek to fight a fair battle. We only ask for victory. So that's about the use bellum, right? So you can begin to apply the three principles. So in short, today this is what the thing has become. A legitimate cause is not enough. There must be proportionality and discernment about the means and the post-conflict process of peace, reconciliation, and even if you want, reparation. Often, both the proportions of, the proportions of means and the process of peace and reconciliation are ignored. But if war does not bring true peace, and if wars can rarely be justified in our modern world, what may one propose as a way to tackle the causes of conflicts and wars in our troubled world? Because even if we manage to prevent some conflicts, this does not mean that we are at peace. Limiting the use of violence, as the just war theory has tried to do, and the teaching of the Christian nonviolence are necessary, but they are not enough. In our times, if we want long-lasting and global peace, Christian nonviolence, nonviolence in the manner of Christ, cannot be a mere slogan. It must be something that becomes concrete. And so in certain Christ's nonviolence fully in his own life and ministry, and discovering how Jesus' attitude is related with his compassion, his love for the poor and the fragile in the world, his love for his enemies, 
his admiration of his father's love and providence for the birds in the air and the lilies in the field. Discovering all of this, we then need to recognize that the nonviolence of Christ cannot be removed from these other manifestations in the life of Jesus. And this encourages us all more and more that to make Christian nonviolence not just a slogan, we need to revisit the life of Jesus to recognize that nonviolence was not just a response to something in the life of Jesus, but was the whole life of Jesus. And if that was the whole life of Jesus, then that invites us all also to be to approach the same issue of nonviolence in an integrated manner. And this is the suggestion that I want to make this uh, today to the discussion about Christian nonviolence as a solution to violence, to conflict, and to wars. Because the challenge of making Christian nonviolence concrete means that this must become a lifestyle by developing an integral culture of an, a, a culture of an integrated love and care for life, which places care for all and just relationship at the heart of all forms of existence in the way Pope Francis presents it in his teaching in the encyclical on integral ecology. For in this encyclical, Laudato Si, the Holy Father draws attention to one thing, and it is how integrated and how interrelated everything else is in this world, in such a way that you cannot separate one from the other, and, and, and then still you know, hope to achieve wholeness or wholesomeness in any area of it. And this interrelatedness all things is what I like to suggest as a basis for our own application of Christian nonviolence. We do not want to limit it only to war. And we do not want to limit it only to situations of conflict. But I'd like to also invite that we present the discussion about war and violence to several other areas in our lives and society. So we can think about the shooting in Las Vegas. We can think about the episode in Ferguson. We can think about the very many other situations and recognize that all of these are situations of violence. And they talk about Christian nonviolence is not just our response or option to military war and violence, but something else that is more radically with us and lives with us. And that is why the, re 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 the reference to Pope Francis's uh, inter integral interrelatedness of everything invites us to do. In the encyclical Laudato Si, in which Pope Francis you know, comes out and teaches us about integral ecology, he, uh, his teaching about integral ecology is the culmination of a series of teachings in this regard by his previous, uh, by his predecessors. And so we know, Pope Paul VI was the first who started talking about natural ecology, care for our environment in popularum progressio. When he talked about the need to develop, he also pay, uh, invited us to pay attention to the natural resources which support our need to develop. Then, after him, Pope John Paul II came and then extended natural ecology to human ecology. So under Pope John Paul II, we're not concerned only about the environment, natural environment, but also the environment of human life, the set of conditions which allow the human person to develop and to develop fully in its full integrity and dignity. That it's not the same sense that we, for example, again, here in the United States, Univers the Rutgers University in New York has a chair for human ecology. And what does it do? It studies the impact of population demography on the environment, okay? And several, several university chairs do that. When they want to study human ecology, it's more the study of the impact of demography on the environment. So how, how, you know, the size of the you know, population in the world and whether the world can feed us and all of that. That is not the sense 
of Pope John Paul II's human ecology. Pope John Paul II wanted to say that there are certain set of natural moral conditions which are necessary for a human person to grow fully and to grow properly in his response to God, his creator. So human ecology, in the sense of Pope John Paul II, it's like saying that just as we need a natural environment for biodiversity and for things in nature to thrive, so do we need a set of conditions also for the human person to thrive and to thrive successfully. And it has to do with moral conditions, it has to do with religious freedom, it has to be respect for human rights and all of those. So that is moral, uh, that is human ecology. The human person itself and the set of conditions which are necessary to make us thrive to make us flourish as persons, creating the image and likeness of God with full dignity and all. So after Pope uh, John Paul II, then came Pope uh, Benedict XVI, and he took the thoughts about ecology further. From Paul VI's natural ecology to John Paul II's human ecology, Pope Benedict then added social ecology and the ecology of peace, inviting us then to bring the same ecology now to social, the social environment in which we live and the need for all of this to support human life. So the sense of ecology is now increasing until Pope Francis puts them all together and talks about integral ecology. And the crucial, the crucial characteristic of integral ecology is the recognition of the interrelatedness of everything in God's creation. And he will say that we are drawn from the material of the earth and it is a product of the earth that sustains our lives. So we, in, 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 if, if you want, we're inseparably related with earth. And on account of that, he'd go on then to look, look at the poor ones in our midst, that we are also related with them and the cry of the poor and the cry of creation are one. So it is this radical interrelatedness which I like to suggest and propose as the basis point of reference for the new understanding, if you want, of Christian nonviolence. It's Christian nonviolence that must attempt not only to respond to the question of war and conflict and violence in our society, but violence in this interrelated relations that we have and that each instance of violence in this relationship diminishes our humanity and involves us in the same risk of responding with violence or exercising Christian nonviolence. So that's where the rest of my uh, presentation this evening is going to be taking us. It's simply saying that let us expand the concept of Christian nonviolence. It's not just against war. And it's just, just against battle and all, but it's against everything that we live with. All the relationships in which describe and make our lives possible. All, our, all these are areas of conflict and violence. And in all of these areas, unless we develop this Christian virtue of nonviolence, it can be chaotic. We'll be fighting and ultimately eliminating ourselves. So from this we can then talk about the Christian program for peace, which is based on this integral ecology with its principle of interrelatedness, how everything in creation is interrelated one with another. And so uh, talking about this, let me begin with the following valuable insights from one of yours, again, we're in the United States, and, and one of the one of the generals this afternoon referred to this. I think it's a Major General, I'll tell you. Major General Charles Dunlop. Okay, so he, uh, he referred to this, and this is a quote from Eisenhower. And he referred to this briefly uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this afternoon. So Dwight Eisenhower, a five, star general of World War II in his Chance for Peace speech of 1953, 
delivered shortly after the death of the Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, made this uh, alarming analysis of military spending against the setting of social benefits. And he said, every gun that is made, every warship that is launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final scene a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat and its laborers, the sweat of its laborers, the genius, the, the genius of its scientists, and the hopes of its children. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this. A modern, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities or two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 population, or two, leaf, two fully equipped hospitals. It is some 50 miles of concrete pavement. We pay for a single fighter plane with a half million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. Is there no other way? the world may live. And this is us now making references to very many experiences and instances in human society. The type of things which are all described by these interrelated, interrelated relationships. Accordingly, we recognize that true security is not found in the size of our military or the number of weapons but when every human need for food, housing, health care, employment, and dignity is met, when the earth is protected and sustained, when we all turn to the methodology and the wisdom of nonviolence as a way of life, pursued and lived in the cordiality of relationships and care for all. The type of care that is Francis writes about an integral ecology. So when we trust in the God of peace and the goodness that is in each one of us, and re renounce fear, hatred, and age-old conflicts, we promise, we promote the dignity and the well-being and the flourishing of each one of us. And in so doing, also diminish violence. Therefore, as you may know, in 1967, in the post-Cuban Missile Crisis era and in the era of decolonization, Pope Paul VI said that development is the new name of peace. In our own day, Pope Francis has revisited the idea of Pope, Francis, uh, Pope Paul and has said this, peace which is not the result of integral human development will be doomed because it will always spawn new conflicts and various forms of violence. This is particularly true when people and nations work to prevent conflicts but ignore the social structures which foment and cause these conflicts. So in order to face conflicts head on, we must address in-depth this violence that is often ignored, the violence of poverty, the violence of inequality, the violence of, uh, the violence of, unf of unfair social systems. The violence, this violence is slower, but it is equally deadly and destructive as the shot or the bomb in the night. This is the violence inflicted by institutions and people through our indifference and inaction. This violence afflicts the poor and poisons relations between individuals, 
and communities who, for example, discriminate against each other because of the differences in their faith. We're witnessing that in the Myanmar with the Rohingyas or tribe or even race. This violence is reflected in the death or illness of a child due to hunger when there is enough food to feed the world or in the situation of girls who do not have access to education in schools without books, in homes without lightning and without heating and without food, in migrants without homes, in peoples, in peoples without work, and in housing and real estate policies that exclude forms of a decent housing to others. The church wants to echo Pope Francis's plea for social justice. For social justice is the haven for any true form of nonviolence, and it is the key for peace. So we want to simply say out loud with Pope Francis in Evangelii Gaudium, no to inequality which spawns violence. For when inequality spawns violence, it will certainly generate another violence. So as you can see, the culture of nonviolence extends way beyond the battlefield and is not limited to war. Before it begins to look at a just war theory, it must look at our hearts and it must look at our societies and it must look at all the relationships in which we live. And so in order to promote social justice that can bring actual peace processes of inclusive dialogue across nations, communities and experts in different fields, all of these are needed. And in the process of this dialogue, that creates social reconciliation, social cohesion, social dialogue, and harmony within society, there Christian nonviolence is created. And when Christian nonviolence is created within our society, it helps us also to develop and create nonviolence outside our society, even on the battlefield and in the case of war. So far from being an abstract concept, integral ecology and integral human development is concretely and directly linked with the current economic system and its ability to develop all forms of violence. Without an appropriate economic system, integral development will not happen. And when integral development does not happen, human dignity is not promoted. The objective of the DECASI for the promotion of integral human development is like the SDGs of the United Nations. Both of them aim at promoting the dignity of every human person and the flourishing of every human being. When in September 2015, Pope Francis was at the United Nations after his visit to the, you know, uh, uh, to the, you know, uh, to speak with the, you know, with the lawmakers of the United States, Ban Ki Moon said that the SDGs are a narrative of human dignity that does not leave anybody behind. So if the SDGs are a narrative of human dignity that does not leave anybody behind, then it's meant to be a program that kind of promotes the dignity of everyone. It is the same objective that drives Pope Francis' teaching about integral human development. The development of every one person entirely and wholly, the development of all people, and ultimately the development of the whole human race, including his environment. And so, gradually wanting to bring all of this to a close, I cannot emphasize enough the importance then of dialogue for integral human development. This is because dialogue best counters the attitude of a dominion and co which causes violence. Secondly, it is because an inclusive dialogue can counter the social exclusion that foments conflict. Thirdly, it is because it's, uh, when we dialogue, we are forced to go beyond our fears and self-interest 
and to encounter and to meet the other person and open ourselves to enjoy the riches of his own being and his own culture. And finally, because dialogue is the only alternative that we know to dominion and imposition. Dialogue is difficult, yes, especially when it is not limited to superficial negotiation. But it is in dialogue that we develop the culture of encounter which Pope Francis talks about and which according to him is the key to develop a respect for the dignity and for the well-being of every person. So, my Lord Bishop, President Harris, and all of you distinguished audience, I'd like to sum up by saying we cannot ignore our current conflicts, but neither can we respond to them violently. The Christian nonviolent way of addressing conflicts is not just about questioning the moral legitimacy of war. It is widening the concept of violence and nonviolence and recognizing that violence does not exist only when we face with war or conflicts outside us, but that violence can exist within us and in the relationships that make us all human beings and members of society. Therefore, the culture of Christian nonviolence must not be sought first and foremost in the place of war and conflict. It must be sought first and foremost within us and in the relationships that exist among us and that makes us all live together in society. This means that we shall be helped to understand what it means to be human. It will help us to live more justly and peacefully as persons and as, human, as members of a human family, all related one with another and coexisting to promote the common good of all of us. So in this common home of ours, we are created to live as brothers and sisters and members of the same family. It is true, the death of any one of us is fratricide because the only real violence that human family knows is fratricide, when a brother is killed by a brother. No other form of violence is, violence is known at the beginning of scriptures about the human family. And therefore, any killing of a human being is a fratricide. It's a brother killing a brother. Since all in the human family, having one father are essentially members of the same family, brothers and sisters. So that being the case, the, the invitation to develop a Christian nonviolence is not an invitation simply to develop something in view of wars that can be fought, but it's an invitation to develop something that makes us all return to our native state of creation when we lived as one family of God, each one loving one another and sticking together. So my dear friends, this has been an attempt to weigh in on this discussion on Christian nonviolence. And it is simply to suggest that we broaden its reference to the situation of war and recognize that that is what we must all develop to enable and to make us all live peacefully in a society working for the common good. Thank you for your kind attention. So I want to thank Cardinal Turkson for a very wonderful, clear, and forceful moral instruction this evening. He's agreed to take just a few questions, so would you have a question or two from the audience? Up in the top. And also, like, sorry, um, sorry, I'll start over. 
Um, but my name's Morgan, and I was wondering, um, do you think that Christian nonviolence is the only way to achieve peace? And what I mean is that there's multiple religions that promote the concept of nonviolence. So do you think that they can coexist together? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, certainly. Certainly different. Now, there, are, there are several values, uh, several you know, uh, contributions that come from the wisdom of several other religions to promote in peace. Uh, the point of reference for this uh, discussion was uh, Christian nonviolence, and that's why I focus in on that. If, uh, if, if the invitation had been to consider the possible contributions of other faith groups to the, you know, the culture of violence, that could have been done too. You want an example? Uh, like I came here from Taiwan, and in Taiwan I visited two Buddhist monasteries. Okay, and the first thing, the first thing they were all eager to show me was, you know, uh, their own, you know, lifestyle and uh, what their lifestyle contributes, how their lifestyle contributes to peace. So I, I accepted that. Then I was in Iran, in Qom, a place where, you know, in Qom, in Iran, that's where the Ayatollahs train. Yeah? And if you meet any Ayatollah, you look at the turban. If it's white, then it's an Ayatollah who become Ayatollah through studies. If the turban is black, then he's, he belongs to the success, you know, he belongs to the line of succession of Muhammad. Okay, so, so there, there also the, the theme of the discussion was the, the, the role of revealed religions to peace in the world. Okay, and for them, the revealed religions are, Christi so they are the so-called religions of the book. So Christianity, Judaism, and of course, you know what? Of course. <laughs> and so it will be Islam, or the other one. So, so, you know, all of them believe that there's a contribution that they can make to peace. You started off noting uh, St. Uh, John the Twenty-Third's work for peace in the Cuban Missile Crisis. I wonder if you'd say a few words about Pope Francis's behind the scenes negotiating for peace today, uh, both uh, in Cuba and we hope perhaps with North Korea. Did you did you say North Korea? <laughs> <laughs> Now, there is, there, there, there is something that I suppose, you know, my Lord Bishop probably also confirmed this. There, there, there is something about all of these moves. Uh, sometimes when you are making those moves, uh, you recognize that the act success depends on how discreet <laughs> they are. I know this because I, you know, uh, at one point I was working uh, you know, it was bringing the two leaders of South Sudan to the Vatican. And was something that had to be just very, very, dis you, cannot, you cannot begin to talk about these initiatives if you're working on them, you know, from day one. Uh, when they happen, then they make the news and then you can talk about them. So, uh, everybody knew when Pope Francis met Obama that there was a talk about Cuba. And that, you know, the, you know, he was there for, you know, the, we all know what happened, okay, which led to uh, the, the thawing of relationship between the U.S. and Cuba. We know, we know, we know that he's working on similar, similar things with Russia and China. The one of China is happening because uh, the, US, the, the Vatican did have diplomatic relations with Taiwan long ago. Now, in the light of everything that has happened in you know, international you know, politics and all of that, uh, and you know the tension between mainland and Taiwan and all of that, uh, even this is not just the Vatican, even the United States, uh, what the United States would have in Taiwan would be a cultural center, not an embassy, okay? Because it's looking at mainland China. On account of that, what the Vatican has in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Taiwan now it's a chargé d'affaires, okay? Uh, uh, for the past few years, 
the Vatican has now replaced the nuncio in Taiwan. I suppose because I did say, you know, right, it's, it's now working also towards normalizing relationship with China. So it's going gingerly looking at both and seeing whether how you can put both of them together. Now, uh, the same thing happened in Colombia. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, if I know I know a few archbishops were sent to Colombia ahead of the post on visit to prepare, and another one was sent to Venezuela to also see what can be. So there are several, several ways that the Vatican, you know, tries to, Vatican diplomacy in this regard, tries to get and to, you know, work for peace in all of these countries, but most of them essentially on the quiet. It's only when they succeed in doing something that, you know, makes the news. About North Korea, I don't know. <laughs> so. Good evening, thanks for being here. I'm sorry, I apologize, I missed the first couple minutes of your, of your speech tonight. And I was curious if you address the subject of just Christian nonviolence in words and speech versus um, when you were discussing greed leading to um, environment and, po and poverty amongst the third world. And then you mentioned justified war criteria and sorry if I'm just jumping around here, but I didn't, I didn't hear anything about like just Christian nonviolent speech, and such as having a President Trump, war of words with, you know, anywhere from North Korea to fill in the blank. But I was just curious if you had addressed that. Mm. <clears throat> no, I gladly talk about you know Christian nonviolence in the you know in other social relationship and. Uh, social experiences, like I, you know, like I said, uh, basically, basically, it was a call to social justice, if you want, uh, where where there's no social justice, violence takes place. Violence replaces, you know, whatever type of thing. Social justice, what it is, and and in that sense, you know, if you want, you know, justice. When we talk about social justice or justice in all of this form, it's not essentially paying back. Uh, paying somebody back for what he's done or whatever, that's not really the sense of justice. Re remember that uh, you know, the Bible, the New Testament especially, uses by justice and talks about justification, that God justifies us. And when God justifies us, it's not because he pays us, you know, he, he, he pays us back for something that we've done wrong and all of that. So, so justice actually, you know, in the, in the, at least in the sense of the scriptures would be when, when, when we respect the demands of the relationship in which we live, then we just. When anybody respects the demands of the relationship in which he lives, that is justice. Between us and God, we know what the relationship is. If we respect that relationship, giving God what is his due, respect, what, uh, worship, and all of that, you know, there are a lot of you know, couples here, husband and wife, and you know the relationship in which you live, husband and wife. And that, and that relationship has demands which you need to respect. When a husband respects the demands of his, you know, marriage or whatever, that's his justice. When a wife does the same, that's her justice. In the workplace, is the same thing. So respecting the demands of the relationship in which you live, that's your justice. And when this justice is not there, there is violence. Because that's when, that's when instead of a, uh, the relationship promoting the dignity and the well-being of people, the opposite takes place. Dignities are not promoted and people feel offended and you know, trampled and upon and all situations of you know, non-violence. So those were the social situations I was referring to. Now whether I'll be able to say something about President, you know, to, you know, about President Trump, let me, let me, let me, uh, there's a proverb in Ghanaian language, so that's where I come from, Ghana. The proverb says that the stranger doesn't eat oily food. You know, uh, and, and oil food means that it can stain your clothes, right? And if, you, if, you, if you're a visitor and you came with one cloth, you eat oily food and your clothes is stained, then you're stuck. So it just means that the stranger doesn't, you, you don't need to enter on all of this, every issue, huh? So you're <laughs> stranger. 
<laughs> no, so so the thing that the thing about about about, about President pre, pre, President Trump, I think, no, I, I you know I think that I need to, yeah, I guess I guess need to respect respect the rights of American people and the president and all of that. So, with your kind permission, no, 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 not going to answers that may end up being judgmental. You know, on 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 the president or his policies or anything that I leave to the local bishops' conference. <laughs> 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 we'll we'll take one more question, so we can go with Mark over here, Mark in the front row. Hi, um, thank you, Cardinal Turkson, for your comments. Um, you talked about, you ended your, your talk with the importance of dialogue when it comes to practicing Christian nonviolence. I'm curious, what does it mean for institutions, um, institutions like universities, particularly Catholic universities like USD, what does it mean for us to fully practice Christian nonviolence at an institutional level? The president didn't ask you to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean uh, you can you can you can think about this in so very on so, uh, you know so very many different levels. So let's take U you know University of San Diego USD. It's a Catholic university. Let's let's talk about student life. Okay, uh, uh, student life is a network of relationships. Okay, the net of religion are supposed to promote, okay, uh, the happiness of every offer, offer, make USD a very congenial environment for all students who come here to be able to study and to be able to excel in what they do. Okay, so in that case, in that case, if there should be anything that makes this impossible, makes this difficult, then uh, you know a sense of Christian nonviolence would 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 uh, would, would would have us uh, rec rec recognize the fact that one, if the source of the conflict is us, we need to try endeavor to discover that. If the conflict, if the source of conflict is not us, and is the other person, then we need to try to see how we can come to reconcile to reconcile with that, and that's when probably the, the dialogue you know, can, 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 can take place. So that's one level. You can also look at the level of students and, and professors, lecturers. On, on, that, on that level also, you can find reason and occasion to develop this same sense of Christian nonviolence. Nonviolence, not because we have people pulling knives and pulling guns or anything like that. That can happen, but that's not the first instance of violence. The first instance of violence that I refer to is a violence within the heart of each one of us. For example, what Pope Francis says in the Encyclical Laud to see is that the violence that is within our heart is what we project on the way we treat nature. So if we treat nature abusively, it's because of the conflict that is within us. So the first nonviolence I like all of us, each one of us to address students or whatever, is that which is within us. Somebody asked a question about other religions. Muslims say that that's why they practice, they, practice, they, 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 they fast. And they'll say that their fight is actually the original sense of jihad, and it is to defeat and to fight against this within them. That's what they would say, okay? So there is this, so the first instance of nonviolence is basically to be able to deal with violence within ourselves. That makes us instruments of nonviolence. I will illustrate this for you. Years ago, I was, I was in charge of a, you know, a, a National Peace Council in Ghana. And we're for, we, we, were, we were preparing political leaders and party men for elections. And to help them move away from violence again, we, we, we had a group, a, a group in the room, about half you know, about a group here, and, we, and they were shown a video Video of the of 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 the of the you know uh, conflicts in Liberia and Sierra Leone, and the thing then was to discuss it. So at the end of that, I asked, well, "So what did you see in the video?" So, so it's a lot of violence. I said, "No, you didn't see violence. You saw people who were violent. 
Uh, you didn't see violence. Violence nobody can see. What we all see is a manifestation of us. So we have about this and then we act on the its influence and all of violence. It's an abstract whatever type of thing. Nobody sees violence. What we all see is a manifestation of violence. It's people who are violent or people who in any way wants to give expression to this. So, uh, so my, 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 you know, the, 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 the first thing, you know, talking about, you know, fighting violence or whatever type of, is to recognize what we're dealing with. What, we, what we're dealing with is, a, is, a, is an attitude. And when, therefore, we also talk about Christian nonviolence, it's first and foremost an attitude that was in Jesus that we try to imitate because we feel, we, you know, we call to be his disciples. So, so that's what it is. On campus, therefore, between students and teachers, between students and the environment. Already when I said, I said, I said to people in Washington, I was coming here, everybody said, oh, it's got a very beautiful campus. The campus is beautiful because you exercise, if you want, ecological justice towards your environment. That's why it's beautiful. You don't litter. You don't walk on the grass. <laughs> you treat everybody, that's, that's again a form of nonviolence towards your environment. So, so, you know, you can place it on several levels and begin to all describe an attitude of nonviolence which enables the other one to prosper and to flourish.